Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the London School of Economics to those who have come from outside the school. Uh, there was a couple who came down from Scotland and have been queuing since midday uh, for this uh, lecture, and we were pleased that they were, we were able to uh, get them in. Uh, we have two other lecture theatres where this is being podcast or webcast, and I think you can also see it uh, on your uh, computer on the LSE system. So there are a large number of people, which of course is entirely a testament to the uh, popularity of our speaker this evening, Professor Noam Chomsky. I should say that this lecture is held under the auspices of our Centre for the Study of Human Rights, and of course Professor Chomsky's subject this evening is human rights in the 21st century. And we couldn't have uh, anybody more appropriate to handle that tricky subject than Noam Chomsky. I'm not going to read out the titles of his 40 books on linguistics and his similar number of books on foreign policy issues. Indeed, I'm extremely hesitant about introducing him at all, since almost certainly I will make some error in grammar or syntax <laughs> which will reveal some dark secrets about my uh, ancestry. Um, but I think that uh, Noam Chomsky epitomizes what we aim to do at the LSE, in that he is, if you like, the personification of the engaged academic, someone whose scholarship is of unquestioned quality, but who also, throughout his academic life, has remained engaged with the great issues of the day. He has been a professor at MIT since 1955, when I was only just alive, um, and continues to lecture and teach there, as well, of course, as producing a remarkable number of publications and commentaries on the passing scene. So, without any more introduction, I'm delighted to welcome Professor Chomsky. He will talk to us and then take questions afterwards. You are very welcome to the school, sir. Thank you. Well, uh, a few hours ago, I was on a panel at uh, SOAS with an old friend, Tariq Ali. Uh, talking about foreign policy in the Middle East, and uh, I was supposed to talk on U.S. foreign policy, and he was supposed to talk on British foreign policy. Uh, he opened by saying, it's easy, there isn't any. Uh, I'm inclined to say the same thing about the human rights and the imperialism that is rather rooted in the South, more deception, as it is in the World Summit version, but not the version preferred by the West. Uh, the crucial paragraphs of the World Summit Declaration, everyone agrees, are paragraphs 138 and 139. You can look them up. Uh, their provisions had never been seriously contested and, in fact, had been affirmed and implemented, for example, with regard to apartheid in South Africa. Uh, furthermore, the Security Council had already determined that it can even use force uh, under Chapter 7 to end massive human rights abuses. Uh, civil war, violation of civil liberties, and so on. Uh, these are resolutions uh, 925, 929, 940, mid-1994. And as a number of analysts, legal analysts, have rightly observed, uh, most states are signatories to conventions that legally oblige them to respect the human rights of their citizens. R2P, exception not mentioned, is the United States. Uh, it's therefore not surprising at all that the General Assembly adopted the Summit Declaration while the sharp north-south split on the so-called right of humanitarian intervention persisted without any change. Well, the second version of R2P in the Evans Report differs fundamentally from the Summit Declaration. In its crucial paragraph, the Commission considers the situation, I'll quote, in which the Security Council rejects a proposal or fails to deal with it in a reasonable time. In that case, the report authorizes action within area of jurisdiction 
by regional or sub-regional organizations under Chapter 8 of the Charter, subject to their seeking subsequent authorization from the Security Council. Now, that paragraph is plain was written to apply retrospectively to the bombing of Serbia, just what was forcefully rejected by the Global South and the World Summit version of R2P. Now, this provision of the Evans Commission effectively authorizes the powerful and nobody else to use force at will. And the reason is very clear. Uh, the powerful unilaterally determine their area of jurisdiction. So the OAS and the AU, African Union, they can't do it, but NATO can and does. So NATO unilaterally determined that its area of jurisdiction includes the Balkans. But rather interestingly, their area of jurisdiction does not include NATO itself. Uh, where at about the same time, as shocking crimes were committed against Kurds in southeastern Turkey throughout the 90s, all off the agenda uh, because the decisive military and diplomatic support for them uh, was by the leader of the free world. Uh, it's peaking in the very year when it was praised for its, the noble phase of its foreign policy with a saintly glow, of course, with the aid of other NATO powers, so plainly that couldn't be included. Uh, NATO later determined that its area of jurisdiction extends to Afghanistan, that's what's being debated now, and in fact well beyond. Uh, the Secretary General of uh, uh, NATO, Dutch uh, Jaap de Hoop Schaeffer, he informed the NATO meeting in 2007 that NATO troops have to guard pipelines that transport oil and gas that's directed to the West and more generally have to protect sea routes used by tankers and other crucial infrastructure of the energy system. That's global. And these expansive rights uh, accorded by the Evans Commission are in practice restricted to NATO alone, They're radically violating the principles adopted by the World Summit. They explicitly open the door wide uh, to resort to R2P uh, as a weapon of imperial intervention at will. They fortify the long-standing U.S. hope and demand that uh, NATO be regarded as an instrument of U.S. power. Uh, part of the reason is to make sure that Europe doesn't move in an independent direction, an old long-term foreign policy concern. Well, let's turn to the second question. How is R2P applied in practice? The answer, I won't run through the details, but the answer will surprise absolutely no one who has the slightest familiarity with history or elementary understanding of the structure of power. Uh, again, I'm not going to run through the highly selective example uh, applications, but just take a couple of examples. So, for example, there's no thought of devoting pennies to protect the huge number of people dying from hunger and lack of health care or deprivation of other rights that are dismissed as myths uh, uh, and uh, dangerous incitement by Washington, <coughs> such as the examples I mentioned. Uh, protected populations are also barred from protection. For example, the victims of the U.S.-Israeli attack in Gaza, who are protected persons under the Geneva Conventions, uh, but uh, merit no protection under R2P. Uh, those who uh, are the direct responsibility of the Security Council are also unable to appeal to R2P. A striking example was Iraqis in the 1990s, uh, subjected to murderous sanctions under the saintly glow of Clinton's policies and Blair's, formally administered by the Security Council, but basically US-British sanctions. Uh, these were condemned as genocidal by the administrators of the UN programs, the respected international diplomats, uh, Dennis Halliday and successor Hans von Sponek, uh, both of whom resigned uh, for that reason, uh, or the victims of the worst massacres of recent years, which are in the Eastern Congo. Uh, and here only the ultra cynical might suspect that the neglect has something to do with the fact that the worst offender is uh, U.S. ally Rwanda, 
and that the multinationals are making a mint from robbing the region's rich mineral resources with the crucial aid of the militias that are tearing the place to shreds. Everyone who has a cell phone is benefiting from that. And all, and on and on, just as the rational would expect. Uh, actually, R2P is rather like what's called democracy promotion. The leading scholar advocate of democracy promotion, a neo-Reaganite, uh, Thomas Carruthers, he ruefully concludes from his careful inquiries that the U.S. promotes democracy if and only if that stance conforms to strategic and economic interests. He says a pattern that runs through all administrations right to the present. He concludes that leaders are for some strange reason schizophrenic, uh, like they need psychiatric treatment. Uh, he's kind of puzzled about this. Uh, critics sometimes speak about double standards, but there's no puzzle and there's a single standard. Uh, it was described accurately enough by uh, Adam Smith, who we're supposed to revere but not read. Uh, he was speaking of England in his day, where, as he put it, the merchants and manufacturers are the principal architects of policy and they make sure that their own interests are most peculiarly attended to, however grievous the effect on the people of England, but particularly the victims of what he called the savage injustice of the Europeans elsewhere, thinking specifically of India. Well, a lot has changed since his day, but that principle remains as one of the few operative principles of international and domestic affairs. Uh, there was great indignation last summer when the president of the General Assembly, Miguel Descoto, called a session devoted to R2P. Uh, the London Economist warned of the danger that, in their words, an angry, inconclusive General Assembly debate might undermine this idealistic effort to establish a new humanitarian principle now coming under attack at the United Nations an attack that the journal conjured up. As I mentioned, virtually nobody opposes R2P in the form adopted at the World Summit. Though there's very good reason to oppose the Evans Commission version and the selective application of the summit declaration. Uh, the Economist editors were, however, encouraged that the angry, angry opponents they conjured up, of whom I should say I was one, uh, they would at least be countered by one panel member, I'm quoting Gareth Evans, a former Australian foreign minister and roving global troubleshooter who makes a bold and passionate claim on behalf of a three-word expression, uh, which in large part, thanks to his efforts, now belongs to the language of diplomacy, responsibility to protect. And their ode to Evans is accompanied by a picture showing him with his hand on his face, uh, grieving that the bold, his bold and passionate claim is coming under threat. And the subtitle says, a lifelong passion to protect. Well, the journal chose not to run a different picture from about the same time, which sheds some light on his lifelong passion. It shows him with his Indonesian counterpart, Ali Alatas, uh, joyously celebrating uh, celebrating the treaty that they had just signed, uh, granting Australia the right to rob the oil resources of what the treaty calls the Indonesian province of East Timor. The tre treaty offered nothing to the people of East Timor or their remnants, the ones who managed to survive the Western-backed onslaught on East Timor. And it's furthermore the only legal agreement anywhere in the world that effectively recognizes Indonesia's right to rule East Timor. So the Australian press reported correctly as far as I know. Now that Evans Alatas picture is quite familiar among people who happen to see a problem when their own countries provide the decisive support for aggression that led to one of the worst slaughters of the modern period, continuing right through the chorus of self-congratulation in 1999 at a level well beyond Kosovo before the NATO bombing. And of course, the past record was far exceeded the atrocities of the Balkans. Well, that's all an uncomfortable topic, 
uh, so the factual record is best avoided or denied, as is regularly done, uh, sometimes in quite remarkable ways, which I won't review. Well, the journal's choice of a photograph should come as no surprise. Uh, 20 years earlier, when the basic facts of the near genocidal Western-backed slaughter, when those facts were quite well known, uh, the editors described the great mass murderer and torturer, uh, Suharto, as at heart benign, which indeed he was, towards foreign investors at least. And he denounced the, what they called the propagandists for the guerrillas in East Timor and Irian Jaya with their talk of the army's sag savagery and use of torture. Uh, that in, the propagandists include the church in East Timor, thousands of refugees in Australia and Portugal, which somehow journalists couldn't find, uh, uh, Western diplomats and the journalists who did choose to see uh, the most respected international rights monitors, and more recently a UN Truth Commission, all propagandists rather than intrepid champions of human rights, uh, because they had quite the wrong story to tell. That's the usual criterion. And who could be a more noble and passionate supporter of R2P than the person who celebrated his achievement in granting Australia the rights to the sole resources of the territory that had been brutalized with full Australian support, and while adding the explanation that it matters little because, to quote, the world is a pretty unfair place uh, littered with examples of acquisition by force. So this didn't really matter. That's all true. Uh, but, uh, but none of this seems to be a matter of concern uh, for the advocates of highly selective R2P and also to the Western intellectuals who feign great indignation at the other fellow's crimes while easily condoning or denying their own, uh, updating uh, a leading theme of the inglorious history of intellectuals from the earliest records. Uh, well, what then are the hopes for human rights in the new millennium? I think the answer is the one that does reverberate through history, including recent years. It's not a law of nature that we have to subordinate ourselves to the violence and deceit of the principal architects of policy and the doctrinal manipulation of the servants of power. As in the past, uh, an aroused and organized public can carve out space for real concern for human rights, including R2P. In fact, today, more easily than in the past, uh, because they can benefit from the legacy of past struggles and, and their achievements. Thanks. We have uh, time for some questions, so I hope that people will uh, both catch my eye, which you have done, um, and also will wait for a microphone to come. So could, could we have a mic on the front row, fourth one, fourth person along, and if you could give your name, and if you could make sure you speak pretty loudly, be, not just for us, but because there are people in other halls listening, and unless you... Articulate. So articulate, clearly. Thank you. <laughs> uh, hi, my name is Samir. Is that right? Yep. Um, my question was, do you agree that uh, countries should intervene when there is a violation, for example, there's a humanitarian crisis? And if so, what would qualify as a humanitarian crisis? That is, at what stage does it become the country who's intervening just using humanitarian uh, as a, uh, intervention as an excuse to um, further its, um, its interest? Well, I, I think that the World Summit uh, reached a good conclusion, uh, the same conclusion as the high-level panel, the same conclusion as the World Court repeatedly since 1949. Uh, there can be a right of uh, intervention uh, when it's authorized by the Security Council. If individual countries uh, accept for themselves the right to use force in what they call the area of their jurisdiction, which is a right accorded only to the U.S. and NATO. 
because they can define their area of jurisdiction. Well, in that case, I think we get exactly the consequences that the court and the global summit and the high-level pan panel uh, anticipated, and which has, in fact, happened. Thank you. Uh, next one there. Yeah, guy standing up. Hello. Hello. My name is John Anneke from We Are Change Media. A recent scientific paper published in the peer-reviewed Open Chemical Physics Journal proves the presence of the military-grade incendiary nanothermite in dust samples taken from ground zero. This coupled with the opinions of nearly a thousand architects and engineers that openly support the controlled demolition hypothesis are inconsistent with the official explanations given by the 9-11 Commission and the subsequent NIST reports. When these explanations have been contradicted by peer-reviewed science and have been disputed by so many experts in the relevant fields, how can you maintain your stance that the findings of the 9-11 Commission are correct? Well, what you're referring to is a statement by a thousand people, most of them basically unknown, who claim certain, make certain claims about technical facts, uh, which I'm in no position to evaluate. I don't know if there's nanothermite in the bottom of uh, Building 7 or if it means anything if there was. And the obvious thing for them to do is present their findings to the people who can make evaluations. So instead of sending 10,000 letters to me, they should send them to the Civil Engineering Department at MIT or other places, or they should publish their articles in the... Uh, in the They publish their articles in, in accessible scientific journals, just like other people do. So, for example, supporters of intelligent design, biologists, and there are some, they publish their articles in standard scientific journals so they can be discussed. And uh, outsiders like me, I don't know much about bacteria, uh, outsiders can make an evaluation of uh, what these claims amount to because of the debate. Well, that hasn't happened. Uh, you could say, and you know, thousands of letters tell me that I should learn enough so that I can make the judgment myself. Well, you know, I know enough about science to know that you can't learn enough in a couple hours on the internet. Uh, if you want to understand these things, you're going to have to do what. There's a region reason why, say, MIT has graduate courses in civil and mechanical engineering, uh, and physics and math. I mean, you just can't pick it up by you know, this, uh, roaming around the internet. And so the question is, well, should I take off uh, the time, years in fact, uh, to learn the technical background and study the structural characteristics of the buildings uh, so that I can make some evaluation of, you know, nanothermite or whatever it is. And I think there's a good reason not to do that. Be <laughs> because these people you're referring to, that they don't seem to understand it are in fact working very hard to absolve George Bush and to implicate Saddam Hussein and Osama bin Laden. And the reason is extremely simple. I mean, everyone agrees, this is uncontroversial, uh, that the uh, destruction of the World Trade Center was attributed to Saudis. Okay, now suppose the Bush administration had done it, they'd have attributed it to Iraqis. I mean, they're trying very hard to find an excuse to invade Iraq. Uh, uh, and if they had attributed it to Iraqis, it would have been a, a walk away. They'd immediately get total popular support. They'd get a UN resolution. Uh, and NATO would pass a supportive resolution. They could go straight and attack. Uh, when they attributed it to Saudis, first of all, they alienated their most powerful ally in the region, most important ally. And secondly, they forced themselves to jump through hoops to try to concoct some sort of a pretext for invading Iraq, you know, weapons of mass destruction, uh, connections between Al-Qaeda and Saddam, you know, the whole business, which of course collapsed, exposing them to ridicule. And they also diverted their efforts to a sideshow, uh, invading Afghanistan, for which there was very little purpose, and, uh, and getting themselves caught up in that and delaying the invasion of Iraq, which they wanted in the first place. So they couldn't have done it, short of lunacy. And if it's lunacy, you know, don't want to talk about it. But uh, who, does, who, do, who does it point to? I mean, who would have gained by attributing the destruction to Saudis? Well, I, I can think of only two people. 
The one is Saddam Hussein, who wanted to divert uh, a, a U.S. attack on Iraq, and the other is Osama bin Laden. Um, the Saudis are his worst enemies uh, to try to get the United States to you know, hate Saudis. It'd be wonderful. And I, at least I can't think of anyone else who might have benefited. So it seems to me all these huge efforts are essentially directed to absolving the Bush administration and blaming Saddam Hussein and Osama bin Laden. And I just don't see any point in taking off years of study to prove that. Uh, the woman right at the back row there, fifth in, yeah. Thanks. Hi, my name is uh, Frederica. I was just wondering if you could say a little bit about um, human right, uh, no, women's rights in the 21st century, considering the fact that um, the Convention of the Elimination of Dis Discrimination Against Women is the least ratified and most contested um, human rights document. If you could say a little bit about the yeah, women's rights in the 21st century, and I won't accept um, there are none. <laughs> uh, would you say something about women's rights in the 21st century, given that the Convention on Women's Rights is the, one of the least ratified conventions? Well, women's rights have improved considerably in the, in the last 50 years, uh, and it wasn't from conventions. It was from activism. Uh, young people, lots of others, uh, picked up things that have pretty ancient vintage and really worked on them in the 1960s and, the and their aftermath, the 70s and the 80s. And one result was a very substantial extension of women's rights. It was a long way to go. There's a report just came out from I think the World, Econ World Economic Forum, was reported here a couple of days ago, uh, ranking countries in terms of how they deal with women's rights. Uh, Britain was, I think, around 40th or something like that. Uh, so yes, there's a long way to go, but there's been a vast improvement. Uh, and, and that's the way human rights are protected. Uh, I, I can't even think of an exception. So it takes a freedom of speech, which is extremely important. And, uh, the United, that's one respect in which the United States is, to my knowledge, alone in the world in setting a high standard for freedom of speech, way beyond Britain, which has horrible laws and principles that restrict freedom of speech. Uh, but uh, the US does have high standards. They are not in the Bill of Rights. Uh, they did not exist through the 19th and early 20th century. Uh, they began to be talked about a little bit in dissenting uh, judgments in the Supreme Court around the 1920s. And gradually, there were a few comments about it. Uh, but they really, uh, the, the court reached a high standard in the 1960s. Now, that was in the context of the civil rights movement. In the context of the civil rights movement, the court addressed a case, uh, uh, Sullivan v. Alabama, I think it was called, uh, which uh, was a case brought by the state of Alabama condemning the uh, civil rights movement, Martin Luther King and others, uh, for the crime of seditious libel. Uh, seditious libel goes you know, way back in history, and it's sustained in most countries like Britain. There's a, still a law of seditious libel. In fact, it's even been brought up occasionally in recent years. Uh, seditious libel is assaulting the state with words. Okay, And uh, seditious libel becomes a more serious crime if the words are true because then it assaults the state even more dangerously. Well, in the, and that was the charge in the uh, 1964 case. The civil rights movement had denounced uh, racist sheriffs in Alabama, it's a state, and so they were charged with seditious libel. It went all the way up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court struck down the law, which was a US law, as it is just about everywhere else, in England, for example. Uh, and uh, OK, that raised the standard for civil rights. Uh, there was a further, now it's a value judgment, improvement in the standards, at least by my judgment, in 1969 in a case involving the Ku Klux Klan, you know, a violent, vicious, racist, terrorist group. Uh, there were charges against them for you know, speech, uh, incitement, and so on, racist speech. And the court decided it, it, the court reached 
essentially the Enlightenment standard, which I think was correct, that speech should be protected up to participation in imminent crime. So for example, if you and I go into a store and you have a gun and I say shoot, that's not protected. Uh, but up to participation in an imminent crime, speech should be given protection. Well, the court did accept that and in the case of the Klan, and I, I think that's right. Uh, and again, I think the U.S. is probably alone in the world in having such a standard. But all of these things came in the course of popular activism. Otherwise, it wouldn't have happened, just like women's rights, just like uh, minority rights. In fact, uh, it's hard to think of a counterexample. So yes, a long way to go, but a tremendous improvement. Thank you. Uh, guy on the third row, yeah, with a stripy sweater. Um, my name is Pong. Um, thank you, Professor, uh, for the um, presentation. I totally agree with you regarding um, the um, responsibility to protect that it needs to go through the um, UNSC. But do you think that there needs to be like a modification of the universities, um, U United Nations Security Council since the member who are sitting in the Security Council, um, for example, like China, will always veto um, intervention um, in Burma? And uh, the second question relating to that, what do you see in terms of the role of China um, and the protection of human rights? Yeah, I, I didn't understand yeah, what exception the, is. The first the question, question is that um, he agrees with you generally, yeah, but says true. that if, it's, um, if these rights are, need to go through, I mean, if a resolution needs to go through the Security Council, don't you think that the balance of the Security Council is wrong, particularly with China, which will always veto an intervention in uh, Burma? Um, and secondly, what do you think more broadly about the role of China in mm. human rights? Well, there's a common view that the Security Council is uh, prevented from acting by China and Russia, but there's an easy way to determine whether that's true or not take a look at the record of vetoes. Uh, that will take you 10 minutes on the internet. And what you will, dis <laughs> what you will discover is very straightforward. Uh, up until 1965, the US didn't veto any resolutions. In the early days of the UN, uh, Russia was vetoing all the resolutions. That's a very simple answer for the reason why. Uh, US power was so extraordinary right after the Second World War that the UN was just an instrument of US power, and the United States was using it to, to beat Russia. So of course they vetoed everything. And that led to an interesting chapter of uh, academic social science, anthropology, and other fields. The leading scholars, you know, Margaret Mead and others, uh, developed theories to try to explain why the Russians were so negative. How come they're saying no all the time? And the main theory that was developed, and you know, seriously discussed was that Russians raise their children in swaddling clothes and that makes them negative. So when they get to security council, they're always saying no. Uh, I, I was a grad student at the time at Harvard and maybe three of us thought that this was comical. And we used to call it diaperology. But that was the, that was the, ex the serious academic explanation for the Russian vetoes. And uh, in the 50s, the UN became more diverse with decolonization and with the reconstruction of the other industrial societies. By the mid-60s, it was no longer a pliable instrument of US power. And that's when the vetoes started. From that point on till the present, as you'll discover if you look, the United States is way in the lead in vetoing Security Council resolutions. Britain is second, and nobody else is even close. Okay, that's the record of vetoes. And of course, the most extreme way to violate a Security Council resolution is to veto it. And we know exactly who's responsible. Well, that's not the way it's usually presented in the academic literature. I remember reading a review of security vetoes by an eminent Oxford scholar of international law who pointed out accurately that the Russians are in the lead in vetoing Security Council resolutions. Yeah, it's true. Uh, if you take the first days of the uh, uh, UN and you eliminate the last 40 years, uh, which slightly changes the story when you look in the background. So yes, there's a possibility that China might veto something, though I don't, I'm not sure China's ever even cast a veto. So, but it could happen. 
Uh, on the other hand, the main vetoes are the United States and Britain. Uh, okay, and yes, they continue to block Security Council action. Uh, I mentioned a couple of cases before, but it continues all the time. Uh, and it's a problem. So what do you do when, uh, say, the, to take the, just take the example I cited, when the, UN, when the United States vetoed two Security Council resolutions calling on all states to observe international law uh, and uh, supporting the world court judgment against the United States for massive international terrorism and when Britain abstained politely. Well, what do you do in that case? The answer is there isn't much you can do except by the populations of the countries. Uh, the populations of the countries can do a lot. They can c condemn it. You know, they can organize, they can demonstrate, they can act, they can put into, into office a government that cares about international law and international terrorism. Well, nobody did it. And part of the reason why nobody did it is because nobody knew about it. It wasn't reported, it's not discussed. You know, you have to go to the court records or the scholarly literature to see what happened, parts of the scholarly literature. Most of it doesn't discuss it. Uh, and yeah, that's the way you get uh, uh, human rights protected. Uh, nobody's going to carry out an intervention in the United States. Uh, nobody's going to intervene in, in the United States and Britain when they uh, uh, implement genocidal sanctions in uh, Iraq, as they did, or when they invade Iraq a couple of years later. In fact, what happens is that the invaders of Iraq are uh, lauded for their achievement. Like, for example, they can be nominated to be president of the European Union, to take one, one example. Uh, okay, well, the only people who can do anything about that are the populations of the countries. Uh, uh, as far as China and Burma is concerned, I, I don't think China ought to be protecting Burma. I don't think that Chevron should be one of the major investors in Burma. I'm pretty sure that British Petroleum is still a major investor in Burma. I know it was up to a couple, few years ago. Uh, so, and those, and there are things we can do about that. We can't do a lot about China, but we can do a lot about Chevron and uh, British Petroleum and Total and so on. Uh, so yeah, let's uh, take a look at the things we can do something about and do them. And when we do that, we can try to think of ways in which we can uh, deal with uh, countries where we can't do anything about them. The standard procedure, almost like a definition of intellectual life, is the opposite. The standard procedure is let's uh, torment ourselves about the crimes of others, which we can't do anything about, uh, and let's ignore or deny our own crimes, often much worse ones, which we can do a lot about. That's I, standard. I think I should come down here. I'm going to give uh, the guy in the t-shirt which says, I love Cairns, Australia. And since you, <laughs> since you uh, oh, had, okay. a lot of, had a go at the Australians, which of course is guaranteed to make you popular in England, um, <laughs> I think I ought to give him a chance, okay? It turns out I'm Canadian, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I was wondering, uh, my name's Alex, I was wondering if you could comment on the role of institutions, elite academic institutions like the LSE in society how you see it and, and perhaps what it, what it could be as opposed to what it is. Incidentally, uh, I gave talks about this in Australia all over the place and they were very popular. Uh, <laughs> one of them was given in Canberra at the National Press Club, whatever the Royal Press Club, and it was broadcast over national television. They liked it so much they repeated it over national television. Uh, the Australians were not at all happy about this stuff and it was one of them's here, it was very strongly, uh, uh, had very strong opposition. In fact, the population of Australia compelled the government in 1999 to start trying to do something about the atrocities that the government was supporting in East Timor. And it was an Australian-led uh, peacekeeping force that uh, was allowed to enter after Clinton called off the dogs. Now, that's another fact that Western intellectuals can't look at. Uh, there was 25 years of massive destruction. Uh, Clinton, in Clinton's view, Suharto the, was our kind of guy. 
Uh, the U.S. and Britain supported it right through the atrocities of 1999, which were increasing. Uh, Britain was the worst, uh, even after the destruction of, even after the European Union had imposed finally a, a, some kind of embargo on arms. Britain kept supplying them. It was supplying uh, jets to Indonesia. This is called the ethical foreign policy, I think, is what it was called at that time. Uh, but the United States finally, uh, under tr Clinton, under tremendous pressure, uh, international and domestic, a lot of the pressure was coming from uh, right-wing Catholic Church s sources and also popular groups. Finally, Clinton told the Indonesians, okay, the game is over. Literally, like a couple of words. They instantly withdrew and allowed a peacekeeping force to enter, Australian-led peacekeeping force to enter without resistance. Well, what does that tell you about the preceding 25 years? Well, it tells you a lot, but try to find somebody who mentions it, because it tells you too much about ourselves, and therefore it's off the agenda. Uh, that's not about your question. <laughs> uh, about the question you really you would answer. I mean, you know way more about the LSE than I do, so you can evaluate what it what its role is and what it does. I mean, I could tell you something about universities I know better, but like my own, for example. Well, my own is an interesting case. It's, 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 not, it's, a, it's a school of engineering and science, not LSE. Uh, but, uh, and I've been there for you know, over 55 years, so I've seen it undergo a lot of changes. Uh, in the 1950s, it was about 100% supported by the Pentagon. In fact, I was there in a laboratory that was 100% supported by the three armed services. Now, interestingly, it was probably the freest university in the country. I mean, I was able to survive at MIT with my own political activism and views and, because they didn't care. The Pentagon didn't care. I mean, the Pentagon knows something about the economy that economists prefer not to look at. That the economy depends very heavily on the dynamic state sector. So if you use computers and the internet and fly in an airplane, uh, you use uh, satellites and on and on. You're, in fact, by, by now, if you use uh, pharmaceuticals, you get you know, genetic engineering involvement, anything like that, you're relying pretty heavily on the state sector, very heavily. Uh, the electronics-based economy of the you know, a couple of decades after the Second World War, uh, was carried out, developed under the pretext of defense. So like you don't go to the population and say, look, uh, we want your taxes, so maybe 40 years from now your kids can have a laptop. Uh, what you tell them is the Russians are coming. So you pour a lot of money into defense, and the Pentagon generals and admirals who understand something about the economy uh, put it into places like MIT, and say, do whatever you feel like. If you want to organize resistance to overthrow the government, that's fine, as long as you're doing your work. Uh, and you do your work, OK, we'll pay you. And, and, and that's been the way it was. It's, it's, I could never have survived at Harvard or down the road. It, it's, it would have been impossible. Uh, but at MIT, it was OK. This lab that I mentioned with 100% uh, supported by the three armed services, was one of the main academic centers of resistance in the country. I don't mean protest, I mean resistance. I mean, like, I was facing a long jail sentence, others were. But they didn't interfere uh, uh, because they knew you know, that their priorities were different. And it kind of continues like that. Now, MIT itself was a very kind of conservative place. Like 50 years ago, when I, when I got there, if you walk down the halls of MIT, what you saw was well-dressed, uh, deferential white males. Okay, now you walk down the halls and it looks like this. Okay, that's, uh, that's, you know, that's a big change. And it came from the usual sources, in this case mostly student activism. And that affected the attitude towards what goes on. So questions about the uses of technology never arose until the late 60s, when there was a small group of students who uh, were pretty active. Uh, some of them you may know, like Michael Albert, who runs ZNet and others. Uh, and they essentially radicalized the student body. 
so much so that within a, a year, Mike Albert was elected student body president on a program so radical I can't even <laughs> repeat it. But uh, and, and uh, some of the actions that were taken were quite interesting. Uh, most of them I opposed. I mean, I have terrible tactical judgment, but I was working with, all, I was close to all these students. But for example, there, w there was an effort back in the 60s to set up what were called sanctuaries for deserters. It was usually small peace groups or church groups or something. Uh, you, you set up, a, you, somebody wants to desert, you organize a few people to stay with them until the FBI comes and picks them up. So the students at MIT wanted to set up a sanctuary. I mean, I thought the idea was crazy. Nobody cared about anything. Uh, but they decided to go ahead anyway. And uh, over my, you know, I participated, though I thought it was crazy. Uh, and they had a, there was a marine deserter, interesting, serious guy. He knew exactly what he was doing. You know, everybody went through it and talked it through. And uh, they set up, they took a room in the student center. And maybe 10 people were there with this deserter, tried to call a press conference, nobody came. Uh, without going into the details, with, within two weeks, the entire institute was shut down. Thousands of students were in the student center. There was an ongoing 24-hour, 60-style 60 60 style event, uh, ranging from seminars on everything you can think of, to rock music, to smells that I couldn't identify, but they could. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and the whole institute was changed, totally changed. I mean, the administration, just a couple of months later, called it, closed the institute for a day to consider problems of uh, ethical uses of technology. And what does it mean? What should we be doing? You know? And it's it stayed like that. I mean, the Union of Concerned Scientists, which is a, 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 an organization of um, scientists and engineers, uh, Nobel Prize laureates and others, that grew out of that. It does very good work. Uh, and uh, the atmosphere of the place changed. Uh, well, okay, that institutions are not fixed, you know, they can be changed through the activities of participants. It's usually young people who do it. Actually, this, this things happened in the 70s, which are highly relevant to what's going on today. Uh, the big issue today, you know, we're all supposed to be excited about, is whether Iran is developing nuclear weapons and missiles, and there's a lot to say about that. But uh, in the 1970s, uh, when the Shah was ruling Iran, uh, the U.S. government wanted strongly to provide Iran with uh, nuclear technology, because he was an ally after all. That was Kissinger, Cheney, Rumsfeld, Wolfowitz, uh, all trying to press to get Iran to develop nuclear technology, which of course can be converted into nuclear weapons. And MIT was pretty naturally picked out as the place to do it. So an agreement was uh, made secretly for the nuclear engineering department to essentially sell itself to the Shah of Iran. I mean, didn't call it that. But they would bring in Iranian nuclear engineers and the Shah would give some unknown amount of money to MIT. Well, like every secret agreement, it pretty quickly leaked out. And uh, the students were galvanized. There were huge protests. Uh, there was finally a student referendum in which 80% of the student body opposed it. It was so much of a fuss that the faculty had to react. So what do you do? You call a faculty meeting. Usually nobody goes to a faculty meeting because it's too boring. You know, some guy reading something falls asleep. Uh, this time, everybody showed up. Must have been a thousand people there because it was a big event on campus. And uh, you know, we had a debate about whether this should go through. Uh, there were maybe a handful of us. I was one maybe five or six others on the faculty who spoke up in opposition. And finally, it was voted about 80% in favor. Now, that's quite interesting because the faculty are the students of 20 years ago or 10 years ago. But enough had changed so that the students were just entirely different in their social, ethical, and other commitments. So you get the distinction. Uh, and of course, that ends up changing the institute, because the students will be the faculty 20 years from now. And those kinds of changes, as I talk about MIT because I know it, but similar changes were taking place in many, many places. 
Um, they probably were here. In fact, I, I re remember things at LSE. You know, I don't like to talk about it because I don't know that much. But I happened to be teaching at Oxford in 1969, and uh, I was invited to give a talk at LSE by one of the great figures here, Karl Popper. Uh, at that time, there had been a student demonstration in which students, uh, I think, took down an iron gate that had some significance, I forget what. And there was one young sort of radical on the faculty, Robin Blackburn, who's a personal friend. Actually, I just had dinner with him last night. But uh, we were reminiscing about it. Uh, there was a, a petition circulated at Oxford where I was saying a very mild petition in support of academic freedom. I don't think it even mentioned Blackburn and the LSE, but said, like, Academic freedom would be a nice idea, something like that. And uh, there were people who signed it at Oxford, almost all American visitors. I mean, not the Oxford members of the Communist Party and so on. They didn't want to sign it. I think mostly on kind of like class grounds or elite grounds or whatever it was. But the Americans, even right-wing Americans, you know, supporters of Nixon, they all signed the petition, and, and knowing what it was. And you know, I finally, when I got to visit LSE, I, I, uh, at first they wouldn't, I, I, I said I would only go if they allowed Robin Blackburn in. He was not allowed on campus. So finally, reluctantly, they made some special arrangements and he was guided in by people who guarded him and watched him every minute to make sure you know, he didn't go to the bathroom or something. But uh, I mean, that was LSE in 1969. I'm pretty sure it's quite different now. And it certainly didn't look like this at that time. But uh, but you know that's really for you to you and people who know things about it to say. But the institutions can change, and they do, uh, very noticeably. Well, I must say one conclusion I hadn't expected from this evening is that I should go out and seek funding from the Ministry of Defence. <laughs> right. um, but uh, I'm going to take we, we're kind of over time. But I'm going to take one last question. The woman on this uh, third row, if that's okay with you, sure. just to run. Let's have one more. Thanks. Okay, really quickly. Um, authors like Mark Hauser have suggested that there is a universal grammar of morality. I was wondering what your thoughts are on that and if you think there is a sort of innate notion of human rights that we have. Well, I think the answer has to be yes for reasons that David Hume discussed. Um, it wasn't just Adam Smith who had smart things to say. Scottish Enlightenment was a great place. If I had a choice to go somewhere, it would be Scotland in the late 18th century. But uh, uh, Hume wrote about this. Uh, he put it in different terms than we would use. But he pointed out that uh, humans have the capacity to make moral judgments in new situations in ways that conform to the understanding of others. And he says the only way in which this is possible is if there are principles that are part of our n nature. Uh, they're, in his terms, they're instincts, meaning part of our nature. He said these are different from the animal instincts that we share with other animals, like you know, obvious ones. Uh, so we have some kind of uh, instincts that are an original part of our nature, and these somehow yield judgments in novel situations uh, which are comprehensible to others and often accepted by others. And if we reach different judgments, we don't just have to throw, sh you know, throw stones at each other. Uh, we can have a kind of moral discourse about it and you know, try to find common ground and see if we can go from there. And he says, well, these are just human capacities. Uh, so it's only possible if we would now say, you know, part of our nature means just genetically determined. And it's like a grammar, so the term moral grammar is not unreasonable. Some fixed set of principles that yields uh, consequences that we use all the time. Like when you and I are talking and understand each other, more or less. Uh, it's because we share internal principles that produce, uh, that allow us to interpret and understand the novel expressions that are appropriate to situations but are not caused by situations, crucial distinction. Big issue in the seventh, that's the core of Cartesian philosophy, for example. Hume was picking it up from that background. Uh, so yeah, there has to be a moral grammar. 
And furthermore, it's got to be shared. Uh, humans have fundamentally not evolved in any meaningful way since they left Africa, maybe 50,000 years ago. I mean, there's superficial changes, you know, skin color, things like that. But as far as cognitive and moral capacities are concerned, there's the slightest evidence of any change. I mean, you take a child from a, an infant from a Stone Age village in Papua New Guinea and raise him in London, he'll be indistinguishable from anybody here in speech and moral judgment and everything, which means that we're all basically identical. And it's, in fact, known that a, a genetic variability among humans is extremely slight as compared with other animals. Uh, and it's, it's pretty obvious reasons for it. I mean, modern Homo sapiens is a very recent development. You know, maybe 100 or 200,000 years, which is just nothing on the evolutionary scale. Uh, and there was a, a diversity in Africa, but only one strain survived, the ones who came out of East Africa and maybe 50,000 years ago, 75,000 years ago. Now maybe it's a little more complex than that, but something like that is apparently true. So there's no, no possibility really of any significant variation. So it must be shared among all of us. And if there seem to be sharp differences in moral judgment, for example, or cultural practices or languages, it has to be superficial because it must be that Fundamentally, it's all shared. Okay, then comes the empirical problem. Let's try to find out what it is. And in fact, there's interesting work on that. Uh, there's a book coming out by, from Cambridge Press, University Press, by uh, uh, John Mikhail, who's actually a former student of mine at MIT, who uh, has done very good work on, uh, uh, part of his work was a critique of the critical analyses of John Rawls. Uh, Rawls, when his theory of justice, very famous now, he originally took this point of view quite explicitly, but he came under such attack from philosophers that he kind of dropped it and pursued other things. Well, Mikhail reviews the critique and argues, I think very effectively, that it has no grounds, and argues that Rawls should have kept with that kind of grammar-based model, and then he develops it. And he also began to do experimental work with some of the experimental psychologists at MIT on trying to test moral judgments from infancy on and also comparatively. And by now, a lot of others have been doing it too. Uh, Mark Hauser, who's a, a primatologist and cognitive scientist at Harvard, has worked on this. He has a book that came out a couple of years ago called, I think, Moral Grammar, in fact. What? Moral minds, yeah. And, uh, and there, you know, others are doing it too. And it, 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 I mean, something's got to be correct about it for Hume's reasons. But to try to find it out is not so simple. You know, it's pretty hard to find out anything about insects. And uh, humans are not only far more complex, but we're barred from doing the experiments that would teach us something. Like you could learn a lot about human capacities uh, if, for example, you could raise infants in controlled environments. Okay, we don't do that, fortunately. But if there were a lot of mangalas around, we would do it and we'd probably learn a lot. And you can't do uh, invasive experimentation with humans. So you can't stick electrodes into the brain and figure out what the cell is doing when you do so and so. I mean, we happen to know a lot about the human visual system but that's because it's almost identical to the visual system of cats and monkeys, and we do allow ourselves to torture them, maybe rightly or wrongly, but we do it. So yeah, you find out a lot about the visual system. But you can't, there's no comparative evidence possible, very little comparative evidence in these cases, because there aren't any other organisms that have the moral and linguistic and other faculties. It's some unique thing that developed somewhere in East Africa, maybe 100,000 years ago, and there's nobody else around. I mean, maybe it developed many times, but humans also happen to be a pretty savage creature. And uh, right through human history, uh, large, way back a million years ago, uh, large animals disappear when 
proto-humans show up, and uh, whatever might have been around in Africa is gone. The Neanderthals hung around until maybe 30,000 years ago, but that's about it. So we, there's basically no comparative evidence. And, uh, and you can't do invasive experimentation. You can't, you can't do the experiments that come to mind, like, say, raising the infants in controlled environments. So you have to find pretty indirect ways to try to study these things, language, moral grammar, and so on. But I think there's pretty good reason to believe that there's something critically important there. I mean, this violates the assumptions of almost all of contemporary philosophy. But it's a dogma that it can't exist. Uh, not for Hume, you know, he was willing to accept it. Uh, and uh, those things have, to, and there's also all kind of uh, ado doctrines in the, you know, say the modern, postmodern literature that uh, says everything's a social construction, it all differs, and so on. So that, that has to go to the extent that it's comprehensible. Not a big problem for me because I don't understand it, but uh, the uh, and a lot more, you know. The, but but the, I think Hume had his finger on the answer. Thank you. We've run well over time. You've been very generous. <laughs>